Has your head felt like it got put inside a Vitamix after searching for good advice on how to manage your larynx and your laryngeal position? Have you felt anxious and confused hearing different kinds of opinions talking about a low larynx, a neutral larynx, a flexible larynx, a stable larynx, ignoring your larynx altogether? I have definitely struggled with all of these questions and experientially and experimentally snotted and cried through many a lesson and practice session trying to understand how to apply all of the conflicting information I'd absorbed from many teachers saying possibly the same thing but being turned into very different information in my brain. I once heard a wise teacher say that the trickiest thing about communication is ensuring that it actually happened. And I think that happens a lot in voice teaching. There may be no more misunderstood or fraught or battled about concept in singing than what should be happening with and inside your larynx when you sing. I would argue that breath management probably elicits more controversy than this topic, but this is way up there in the hot potato zone for sure. Hi, if you're new here, my name is Dan Calloway. I teach musical theater, voice, and vocal pedagogy at Boston Conservatory at Berkeley. 25 plus years working on equity stages and more than 15 years helping singers get to work on Broadway, national tours in the regions and around the world, and I am very glad you're here. The first time I ever heard the term larynx mentioned in teaching was from my college voice teacher, Kathy McNeela. Everybody was listening to the brand new cast recording of Rent, and discussions were flying about high laryngees and belting and things like that and of course there was a great divide among the musical theater kids and the classical kids and I asked Kathy what is a high larynx and she said oh I don't think you're capable of singing with a high larynx and she meant it as a compliment because my training had been very steeped in classical techniques so I was always singing with a medium to low laryngeal position as far as I could understand it at that time. I was also lucky that when Kathy had done her master's in vocal performance at the University of Michigan, she was kind of a rebel and headlined for a rock band that traveled around singing I Feel the Earth Move and other such hits of the time. So she transmitted to me that there were many different ways that someone could sing with sustainability and longevity. Now mind you, she did say we all had to learn to sing Mozart before we could belt and at that time that was a great path for me. So in this video I'm going to show you ways to determine if your body use around your larynx might be posing some inefficiencies in your singing and give you practical ways to bring balance and ease where there might be inhibition. I'm going to show you that especially with theater singing your larynx can be in many different places at many different times depending on the character you're embodying and the style you're singing. I'm also going to show you that the larynx can be in all kinds of different neighborhoods and all kinds of different styles. There isn't one place for the larynx to be in a certain genre. And I'll also break down for you how exactly your laryngeal depth or height affects the sound waves that move through your vocal tract. And I'll also give you some very practical frameworks to play with so that you can explore your own laryngeal positioning so that it becomes a fun thing to explore in making your own sound colors rather than causing you stress about whether or not you're adhering to a certain set of vocal rules properly. So first, some background to help you understand how we got here. If you've studied singing for any amount of time, you're going to hear opinions about what should and should not happen with the larynx. One very ubiquitous opinion that permeates a lot of vocal training is that the larynx should remain in a medium to low position in order to create optimal sound color, balancing, as well as maintaining vocal health even. These are the opinions that I've heard a lot. And I operated with this assumption for many years, thinking that a medium to low larynx was always my friend, and I taught these principles when I began to teach because that was what I knew from my experience. It was actually when I spent some time at Complete Vocal Institute in Copenhagen, and especially with one of their teachers, 
Christopher Hegland when my point of view completely changed. One day we were talking about Passaggio and Christopher nonchalantly said, Oh yes, the larynx goes up when you sing higher notes, as if he had just said, Oh yes, your lungs are useful for breathing. My opinion alert went off immediately, and when he saw my dubious expression, he backed up what he said with science, and he explained that, oh yes, from their own research there through stroboscopic video research, and even now with MRI research, what goes on when singing, the laryngeal position naturally moves higher when the voice sings a higher frequency. That's the natural movement of the larynx. Still dubious, I decided to suspend my disbelief for just a moment since I was there to learn from him and try what he was talking about. And I was pretty amazed to see what the result was when I allowed my larynx some freedom to move as I went into higher pitches. I found that there was more maneuverability and flexibility through different ranges, whereas before, when I attempted to keep my larynx in one position, the acoustic shift felt a lot clunkier and harder to manage. There was also a much more distinct shift in tone color when I would cross transitional points. So Christopher told me that while my larynx was given freedom to move, so were all the other parts of my vocal tract. My pharynx, my soft palate, my tongue, my jaw, how I formed my lips. The larynx then became part of a whole collaborative team, making up my vocal tract that could shape sound color in all kinds of different ways. I realized that I had absorbed a lot of what I call classical catechism through my years of training in which tenets of bel canto singing become like religious dogmas that if you break them, you're offending an operatic pantheon looking down on you saying, if you dare to move your larynx one millimeter more, we will punish you with substandard young artist program appointments. Seriously though, some of the rules that I've noticed get transmitted down in voice training come from this very letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law, rules and regulations. And you have a lot of singers trying to apply principles that they think they heard from a well-meaning teacher and just keep working harder at a certain coordination that might not be giving them the outcome they desire. And a lot of this larynx ideology comes from the Western classical aesthetic framework. I'll explain that to you. Bel canto singing emerged as a means to produce vocal sounds that could collaborate well with various groupings of instruments at that time. Folks during the Renaissance and thereafter developed resonance strategies that helped the voice to amplify and carry through different spaces from small chambers all the way to large opera houses. The other aspect of this aesthetic is seeing the voice itself as an instrument. What I mean by that is cultivating a vocal technique so that the voice presents as a uniform acoustic shape rather than singing in what we would call vernacular styles that emulate more speech patterns and sounds that we would associate with folk musics or musics of the people. Think of the shape of any musical instrument. So a piano is always the shape of a piano. A clarinet is always the shape of a clarinet. A violin, always the shape of a violin. Therefore, the resonance that that instrument will produce is always consistent. The same aesthetic holds true with classical singing, where a sense of unification is cultivated through legato and what many call an open throat, the principle of chiaroscuro, light and dark together, that experience of singing. So I can demonstrate that to you by just singing a couple of passages in both styles so that you can see what I mean. So if I sing this passage from Handel's Messiah, come unto him in the customary style, you will hear that the shape of my pharynx and the neighborhood of my larynx are rather uniform. Come on to him. If I sing the same phrase in a more vernacular style, allowing my tract shape to shift in more speech-like patterns, it'll sound like this. Come on to him, all ye that labor. 
Now, on the other hand, if I sing a phrase of something traditionally vernacular, like James Taylor's Your Smiling Face. Whenever I see your smiling face, I have to smile myself because I love you, right? Something like that. That has a very speech-like quality. And then if I change my tract shape over to a more classical posture, whenever I see your smiling face, I have to smile myself. So it sounds funny, right? But what people don't understand is that this low laryngeal religion has spilled out of Western classical singing teaching and permeated all kinds of styles so that singers think that they have to cultivate this controlled laryngeal position in order to create effective sounds in multiple styles. I will even go as far as to say that in classical singing, the larynx needs to move. Even when you hear Pavarotti talking about his technique and saying that the larynx needs to go down, I would bet you a frozen yogurt that if someone had been able to do an MRI on when he is singing the high C in La Boheme or the B in Nessun Dorma, that his larynx went higher. You can hear it in the frequency patterns of his brilliant sound. When I listen to him with empathetic listening because I've copied Pavarotti a lot, I hear his larynx floating upward. I could be wrong, but I'm just telling you that's the experience of my ears and my empathetic listening. So here's the great news. Your larynx can go lots of different places to accomplish lots of different things when you sing. There is not one right answer and you can experiment with different strategies on the same song to see what works best for you. The question you always need to ask yourself is, is the strategy you're using effective? Does it promote balance and efficiency and ease? And if the answer to any of those factors is no, then it's time to regroup and ask yourself, what could you try that will bring balance, ease, and efficiency to what you're doing? Just because someone found a way to coordinate their larynx position, vocal fold oscillation, and vocal tract shape to accomplish a favorable outcome on one phrase of one song does not mean that that is the golden position for all laryngees everywhere. If you're singing, you are moving, and music is always moving. We really get into trouble when we try to find an answer and then tack it down on some imaginary corkboard with 17 pins, hoping to always have the right answer and coordination for everything we do. Every phrase you sing is different from every other phrase you sing and requires a different amount of breath, a different amount of support, and a different vocal tract configuration inside an entire stylistic and emotional world. I tell you all of this so that you will set yourself free with the joy and blessing to let yourself try things and play and figure out what works for your particular voice which is like nobody else's in the whole world. So I want you to cut yourself a lot of slack and remember that the larynx is an incredibly vulnerable, energetic zone in your body. It is the center of your expression and vibration. So of course it's gonna feel potentially emotionally uncomfortable to let it feel loose and even trust that this area is capable of figuring itself out when many experiences in your life may have taught you that it wasn't safe to trust the emotional environment around you. In families, learning that expressing something authentic, a sense you have, a feeling, or noticing something was wrong, often that could have been met with rejection for not adhering to the family narrative. Maybe you tried out for a solo in junior high chorus only to be met with criticism or ridicule and deciding from that day forward that it was not safe to sing alone in front of people. Maybe a teacher said something one day that they had no idea was super damaging, but you carried that one statement with you for years and didn't let yourself sing. All kinds of experiences collect here in the muscles in and around your larynx. And when you start to say yes to that burning desire that needs to sing, that often stands in direct conflict to all the signals that have been setting themselves up in this area, trying to keep you safe and to filter out expression that could put you in more painful situations, things can feel at odds. So just remember, learning to let your larynx experience some freedom can indeed cause you emotional discomfort. But I always say, 
you have handled discomfort before. You can handle it. The discomfort that you have to handle in order to let some emotional energy release and teach yourself some trust is absolutely worth the joy and satisfaction that is ahead of you when you have a singing technique that allows you to express with authenticity, joy, and artistry. So how do you determine if your body use and the way that you are relating to and interacting with your larynx could be posing some inefficiencies in your singing? And what are some practical ways that you can bring balance and ease there where there might be inhibition and strain currently. I will share with you a quick story that may help you connect your own experience to what may be going on with your larynx. I was in a relationship at one time where I didn't believe it was safe to express myself honestly. This was due to a whole matrix of beliefs I was working with that I thankfully discovered to be untrue later. But at that moment, I had committed myself to a relationship that wasn't serving me or the person I was in the relationship with. There was one particular time when I felt so many unsaid things pressurized inside me like an emotion geyser that I felt actually choked around my neck with the pressure of keeping all these things inside. I had allowed myself to agree to things that didn't line up with my values and then I had the erroneous belief of feeling like I couldn't go back on the things I'd already committed to or said were okay in the relationship. I literally went out to find my car parked on the street, got in, locked the door, and shouted my head off for a good three to five minutes. Not only did this not relieve the muscle and emotional pressure I felt around my neck at the time, but it blew out my voice for a good two weeks. And I had a gig coming up, so at the first rehearsal, the composer I was singing a song for wondered why I sounded like I was doing a bad Joe Cocker impression. I tell you this story to say that your body knows when something's up. If you're in a situation where you feel like your expression is blocked or you're not able to let honest communication flow through you, you will often feel a physical manifestation of that reality. I've had many times in my life where I felt physically squeezed around my throat when I felt like I wasn't able to just say out of my mouth what I was seeing with my eyes. This same emotional trap sets itself up when we try to sing according to a set of prescribed rules rather than checking into the reality of our bodies and the stories we are believing when we make sounds on prescribed pitches and rhythms, which is what theater singing is. Prescribed pitches and rhythms and believing a story. You may experience it as discomfort when you sing. You may experience it as feeling fatigued very quickly. You may experience it as a slight choking sensation or a barrier that you can't really break past. When you sing, you know in your guts you could feel freer or like there's just a sense of pressure or squeeze that you long to feel release from. You may also feel a sense of stuckness where there's not any variety to the voice or sound color. This could also point to a static laryngeal position and a lack of freedom and ease to let this structure move as freely as it would if you were having a conversation with a loved one that you trust implicitly and who makes you laugh and see the world with joyful perspective. The way I like to go in to this area is through play, through playing. If you can find a way to add some play and joyfulness, it will increase your ability to learn many times over. It's when we get super brow crunched and take ourselves very seriously that the ego takes the helm and we're not able to integrate as many things into our body and new understandings. So you can just start to play games with laryngeal position. Let's actually use the characters from the movie Inside Out to play around with this. Okay, so let's start with Joy or my version of Joy. So Amy Poehler's voice, right? So her voice there has a very neutral, bright quality, and her larynx would be in what we would call a pretty medium position. She has good balance of light and dark qualities in the vocal sound, and her laryngeal position is in a very speaky, I am in charge of the crew place as we take care of Riley. Yeah, so that's kind of her vibe. Then if you turn to sadness, you'll see her laryngeal position sits really a lot farther down, literally down, because 
her energy is low, or he, her emotional center feels lower, and even her body position will drag down because she lives in this zone of sadness and sorrow. Then you can take disgust and you can play around with her laryngeal position and you'll find that she is using a higher laryngeal position which makes a lot of sense because if you were trying to push something away from you because you're disgusted by it, your muscle groups are going to recruit themselves to expel something away so you feel the tongue and the larynx and everything coming up and out to sort of defend against anything that might come in your zone that would be untouchable or Ew, gross. The other thing I want you to see is that these three characters' laryngeal positions are completely determined by who they believe themselves to be and the way they see the world. Every character you ever embody in musical theater is going to have these primary questions at their foundation. Who am I and what do I believe is happening? And even if theater singing isn't your thing, whatever style you feel most at home inside also has an identity, a dialect, and a point of view on the world. These questions apply no matter how you are sharing music through your singing. But asking these holistic questions gives you a very clear framework as to why the character you're embodying has a laryngeal position like they do. So keep your ears out when you listen to different people speaking throughout your daily life and ask yourself, what must their self-concept be and what must they be believing is happening in order for their vocal tract to orient the way it's orienting right now? And also just remembering that all of the laryngeal positions are on the table depending on what kind of character you're playing. There isn't an objective right or wrong here. The only thing that would be wrong would be something that would be inefficient or damaging to you, or something that doesn't align with the intent of the story you're telling. So before you sing a note, I just want to invite you to play with feeling what happens when you move your larynx in different positions. What psychological effects does it have on you and how do you notice your energy shift when you play with different configurations? What happens when you're giving it some late night jazz DJ vibes? What happens when you sound kind of like my cousin Tommy? And what happens when you do your best Oprah voice with a rather low larynx and a high soft palate. Why do we associate certain things with this low laryngeal position and certain characteristics with a higher laryngeal position? Again, just get in your sandbox and play around with different vocal images. You'll start to see that all the sounds we make as theater singers are constructions of different identities that shaped themselves in different ways. Another terrific way to encourage ease and laryngeal flexibility is to add actual pitches and yodels. So you're going to want to sing some easy pitches in your head voice, mode two, coordination, E and O, those vowels are great for this, and then just wobble and yodel down into your mode one chest voice, and vowels like A ah and E eh are really good for this. So it can really be any interval. Let's use a fifth to experiment with this. So you can Then you can move it to an octave if you like. Those are fun. And I always do this. This is, I call this rubber chicken. So that's what I want my larynx to feel like in this exercise. These yodels encourage laryngeal flexibility because you're letting the larynx and your folds respond to a vocal tract shape. The changing of your shape is having a retroactive effect on the mechanism there. So, so letting that abrupt shift happen gives your larynx the ability just to flop. And that translates over into all kinds of ease when you are making more coordinated blended sounds. If you're having trouble accessing a yodel or letting your larynx flop in response to your vocal tract shape changing, then there are a few little characters you can play with to help you get this feeling going. So this one I call the tired, exhausted friend who doesn't want to hike anymore. And so this is a great example, like, how much longer when are you gonna get to stop? <laughs> okay. Or maybe that's the friend who doesn't want to leave the party, yeah? I don't wanna go. 
Yeah. So another is the tipsy old man at the corner of the bar. My friend Jen from acting class in New York, she used to bartend at an Irish pub and she had like a whole collection of impressions that she did. But one of her people, so I'm, I'm doing an impression of impression. You let oh, I can do a stupid life. Hey, Jen, can I get another, please? Can I get another one, please? So, yeah, that that character. I was thinking of the Santa Claus in Miracle on 34th Street. I don't know if this is what he actually sounds like, but um, he's had too much whiskey at the beginning of the parade, and he's like, a man's got to do something to keep warm. I think that's how he said it. So that's another image to get your get your yodels going. One other that I like to play with, I call this redneck cheering for what he thinks is going to be a completed pass and when the receiver drops it in the end zone. So that would be like, whoa! Whoa! Yeah, redneck cheering for what he thinks is going to be a complete pass. So keep your ears open to where you hear natural registration shifts in your life and play around with those things that will help you feel what the actual muscular coordinations are and then you can recreate them artfully when you sing. One other idea that comes up for me is our six-year-old when when the five-year-old is, is torturing the six-year-old, he'll be like, Jude! <laughs> so that's another point of uh, a vocal registration abrupt shift in that's a common part of my life. Now that you're having some fun with the larynx and playing and also discovering what kinds of characters and vocal images arise when you let your larynx be in different positions as well as building your own laryngeal freedom and flexibility, I'm gonna demonstrate more specifically, especially with theater singing. Your larynx can be in many different places at many different times depending on the particular character you're embodying and the style you're singing. I'm also gonna show you that the larynx can be in all kinds of different neighborhoods within the same style. There isn't one place for the larynx to be in a certain genre. And I'm also gonna break down for you how exactly your laryngeal depth or height affects the sound waves that move through your vocal tract and what your laryngeal position does for your acoustic leverage. So my big laryngeal light bulb that I told you about that happened when I was working on an Italian song with Christopher in Copenhagen. We worked mostly on rock singing, which was his home style, and also on vocal effects like distortion. But the thing that impressed me so much about my work at Complete Vocal Institute was that there were teachers who didn't know a lot of classical repertoire and were able to help me with my Italian songs very quickly and very effectively. I saw that the system that they were working with was really applicable to so many styles. I was working on this really beautiful song by Paolo Tosti called Ideale, or Ideal, Ideale, and there was a passage that went up to an A5, and I kept having instability with that particular note. I wasn't sure what vowel to use, and it was hit or miss. So this is when Christopher offered me the very controversial advice to let my larynx come up, and when I tried it, I really loved the results. So the phrase sounds like this. I will demonstrate first attempting to keep a neutral or stable laryngeal position to show you how I was working to begin with. So the phrase goes, is, is this. So I'm gonna keep my larynx where I was trying to keep it before Christopher gave me the advice to let it float up. Una novella aurora. So that's how it was going when it went well. When Christopher invited me to let it float up a little bit, it this was the coordination. So now I'm just going to let it float up a little bit. Una novella aurora. So you can hear the color differences in those two events. And on days when it wasn't working so well, the outcome was more like Una novela aurora. So that was also an event that happened sometimes. So Christopher showed me that if I let my larynx gently rise, 
I would also be able to let my soft palate and pharynx collaborate with that slight shift so that I could also provide the warmth and coloring to the sound that I wanted to. So look, this will be my larynx and this will be my soft palate. I'm going to let both kind of float up. Luna novena Because if I don't let the soft palate float up as well, you will get this sort of squeezy feeling. So that's how you let different parts of the tract collaborate with each other. It was great information because I didn't have to depend on where my larynx was in order to create the classical aesthetic that I was going for in that song. There were other options available to me. I did feel a little like I was out behind the shed smoking and three of my previous voice teachers were about to come around and take me to the principal's office, but the outcome of it was so successful that I kept exploring these possibilities. I also listened to different singers with new ears because when I realized a lot of what people were calling a stable laryngeal position wasn't really all that stable, it really was terrific information. I could hear in singers there was a lot more flexibility in the movement of the larynx than people might have led me to believe. So I like to think about the larynx floating and it's like a boat on water. You give the larynx permission to be buoyant. And if you think about basic acoustic principles, this all makes a lot of sense. If I have a long tube and sound waves travel through this tube, the fact that the tube is longer will affect the frequency at which the sound waves and partials will travel through this tube. If this tube gets shortened, the frequencies of the waves also get higher. You can even hear this if I take this little plastic tube and stretch it out. And then if I scrunch it back in, Okay, so the very sounds it makes just from the action of the plastic accordioning out, you can hear that the shorter tube elicits a higher frequency and the longer tube encourages a lower frequency. So your pharyngeal tube and your vocal tract operates in the same way by the same principles. If you provide a long tube north of your vocal folds that are vibrating, there will be lower frequencies happening in that overall sound color. And if you make the tube above your vocal folds shorter, then there will be a higher frequency. And you can experiment with this just by using a robot voice on a prescribed pitch. So I'll choose, I usually speak around this pitch right here. So if I choose this, this is A. If I choose this and I just speak on this pitch and I don't leave it, you will hear the effect that my laryngeal depth and height has. If I speak on this pitch with a low larynx, you can hear the low frequencies influencing the sound. And if I raise my larynx quite high speaking on the same pitch, you can hear the frequency outcome that happens because I have shortened my tube. Yeah. So equipped with this information, you can make all kinds of choices about where you can experiment with your laryngeal position. If you're struggling on a higher pitch, you can give your larynx permission and freedom to elevate just a little bit as your folds stretch to a thinner vibration and a higher frequency and see what kind of outcome that provides you. Again, it all depends on the sounds you want to make in the particular song that you're singing. You may very well want to sing a higher frequency with a lower larynx in order to create a very specific effect. Now here are some practical examples from musical theater singing. Let's start with the lower laryngeal neighborhoods and move our way higher. You may hear a low laryngeal position for Judd Fry's material in Oklahoma. His larynx might want to hunker down inside him much like his personality and belief that he is an isolated animal not able to build a bridge out to anyone else. So he has this little pattern. The floor creaks, the door squeaks. So his larynx might want to hunker down inside of him. The character of Nettie in Carousel or Mother Abbas in The Sound of Music, they will have a low to medium laryngeal position as well. Both of these characters provide anchoring maternal energies that settle down into a lower laryngeal space. So like... 
when you walk through a storm, keep your chin up high. The larynx might live in that lower area. I'm also thinking if you listen to the original cast recording of The Mystery of Edwin Drood, Cleo Lane as the Princess Puffer, she sings with a very smoky jazz influenced low laryngeal position. So those are just a few examples of many, many, many examples. Musical theater is full of all kinds of examples of mid-range speech-like laryngeal positions. Almost anything that Liz Calloway sings is going to be a demonstration of this really balanced middle ground of an efficient and colorful voice that lives in the mid-speech range. In her early work as Lizzie in Baby and then all the way through her recordings and concerts of Stephen Sondheim's music, William Finn's songs, uh, Anastasia. I'm just thinking about that Journey to the Past song. I don't re remember the lyrics, but is it like, Heart, heart, don't fail me now. Da, 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 da. Very mid-larynx, speech-like coordination. Danny Burstein is also a favorite singer of mine, mostly because he chameleons into every role he plays. And I have so much respect for him as an actor and how his voice shifts from role to role. And also, I was always a big fan of Jason Danieli, his voice. He sings with a very mid-level speech-like quality. And I remember hearing him sing in The Full Monty on Broadway and thinking, wow, what would it be like to soar through those notes with so much freedom and beauty? He became a vocal model for me. So I will link to these different singers in the description so that you can check out their qualities and these things I'm talking about. And then in the higher larynx categories, you've got voices like Idina Menzel when she's in her higher edge production. And I think of Alanis Morissette. She's also a terrific vocal example of a higher laryngeal position. I recently heard her in concert and her voice sounds just terrific. It's the same sharp edge but mellowed and balanced and I think all of her mode 2 registration shifts that she incorporates into her vocal style I think they've served her very well with laryngeal freedom and vocal ease also some of the character voices that you hear in the Book of Mormon uh, hello my name is Elder whoever yeah that's a higher laryngeal position and I'm also thinking of like voices from 42nd Street uh, like um Get out your tap shoes, Francis! <laughs> Julian Marsh is doing a show! Yeah, so that's a very high larynx. And of course, there's just a plethora of musical theater written in the last 30 years that employs higher belting and track shaping that has a higher laryngeal position. In all the examples I listed, you're going to find instances where these singers make sounds with all kinds of laryngeal coordinations. That's why it's also important to remember that your larynx can travel to lots of different places within the same show or within the same style. I think the score from Waitress is a really good example of this. If you look at Jenna's song, she has a lot of low speechy lines and then she moves into higher coordinations where her larynx needs to rise to balance out some of those more mixed sounds. And then the vocal track written for Dr. Pometer is also really varied. He has some really low baritone moments, especially when he's singing It Only Takes a Taste with Jenna, and then later when they're singing their song um, Bad Idea, he's sailing quite high, and so his laryngeal position is going to also flex into a higher location. So the same role can exhibit all kinds of different laryngeal functions, just like a human would through the course of their day, expressing different things to different people. Just real quick, I think on She Used to Be Mine, Jenna starts off with this very reflective speech-like quality with like a medium, maybe even, I mean, it, it could be a low larynx if she wanted it to be. I don't know that she necessarily has that though. It's not simple to say most days I don't recognize me. So very much speech, a lot of space as she's reflecting internally. And then later when she gets to those um, sustain notes in mine used to be mine that's going to have more of a higher larynx just for the coordination of that particular pitch and that moment 
that pays off emotionally. So a good way for you to play with what your larynx does at different positions is to sing a series of exercises while employing different laryngeal depths and heights. You can just take a simple slide of a fifth and sing it with three different laryngeal positions. You can start with a medium position, move to a low position, and then move to a high position, and then just see what that feels like acoustically and muscularly. So you can just take a... If you were to take it into mic mode two. Things like that. This will start to map your mind and your muscles to be able to coordinate and allow the larynx to go in different places. It will also confirm to you that frequency and pitch happens inside the larynx by the vocal folds. And then the way that frequency is then shaped depends on a lot of different factors and how you shape the vocal tract. So you can do the slide on the fifth, or you can literally just take a phrase of repertoire that you're working on and do it with different laryngeal positions. So you can even shift laryngeal positions in the middle of a phrase. So like, just take even that first phrase of, um, she used to be mine from Waitress. It's not <laughs> medium larynx. It's not simple to say. And then if I want to lower it down. It's not simple to say. And then if I wanted to raise it. It's not simple to say. So different colors, right? It's not simple to say. I probably want to go with a medium range on that. But it's really fun to just play with the with the contrasts because you might find a place along the continuum that you wouldn't have discovered otherwise. Again, it's really important that you play with this and have fun because not only will that help you to relax a little bit with your vocal training, it actually helps you to map these new neural pathways much more quickly. You can even take some of the characters I mentioned before and play around with them. If you sing Climb Every Mountain with varying laryngeal positions, you would see how drastically it affects the sound and also perhaps find some new comic possibilities for your club act. Climb every mountain, search high and low, follow every rainbow, till you find your dream. Silly. You can also just experiment with one frequency at a time and see what laryngeal depth or height does to affect that frequency. So, medium, low, low, medium, high. As simple as that. Again, the principle for this is to play and the framework is experimentation. If you know what does what to what, then that's all kinds of possibilities that you can employ and figure out some things on your own. You just need a few tools and some basic understanding of acoustics in the vocal tract to start to have a lot of fun with your voice. And one other exercise framework that I found very helpful is to move your larynx to places that it wouldn't naturally go. For example, singing higher pitches with a very low larynx and singing lower pitches with a very high larynx. So this accomplishes a few things. Number one, it's silly, so it makes the practice fun. Number two, it helps your brain cross wires a little bit so that you're working with counterintuitive skills that in turn demonstrate how various coordinations of your vocal tract make very significant differences. So if you sing a higher frequency with a very low larynx, that tube shape is going to infuse that high pitch with lower frequencies and vice versa. If you're singing a lower pitch with a very short vocal tract, tube, then you're going to have a lot of sharp high frequency influencing that sound. It's also really terrific information for things like singing low notes. You can realize how you can shape your vocal tract to get more leverage in places that may have been a little woofy and hard to amplify in the past. So real quick, if I would... I can move my larynx all around there on, that's an A, yeah? So then if I'm singing this A, hey, that's a medium larynx, but if I go, hey, 
So then knowing that that higher larynx gives you a little bit more leverage, hey, you can let the larynx float up so that you get more acoustic leverage in your lows. So these three areas of focus will do wonders in acquainting you with your own vocal track shaping and help you make friends with your ability to maneuver and work with what your larynx wants to do in certain situations. Number one is just your relationship and witness of your own body and sensing where you want more freedom, more balance, more efficiency, more satisfaction. Just listening to your body's cues is crucial and foundational to this work. Check into how your throat feels when you're letting vibration through. If you want it to feel easier, freer, and more expressive, then really tune into how you're feeling around that and ask the structures around here what can help to make things feel freer and more balanced. I think you'll be surprised at the information your body gives you in these instances. The second part of this is just building awareness and training your ears to hear different laryngeal positions in different kinds of singing. The more you are listening to other singers with your entire body and letting your mirror neurons fire, you will understand so much more about your own vocal tract. So just listening to certain sounds and knowing from their quality, oh, that's a lower laryngeal position. Or, oh, that quality tells me that their larynx is in a higher position. Then you're going to be able to coordinate your tract in all kinds of ways in order to authentically communicate and embody the roles that you want to play. And then the third piece of it is to take the understanding of the mechanics that you know and then use those to start to play around you know what lower laryngeal sounds feel like, and then you know what higher laryngeal sounds feel like, and then you understand what a medium larynx communicates. So you can start making all kinds of sounds and then seeing what kinds of characters these sounds suggest to you. And then you have a whole toolbox, or I guess I should say a whole color palette available to you that you can paint with. Your larynx hangs down from the hyoid bone by a delicate membrane. It's the only structure in your body that is suspended in the way that it is suspended. So it's very important that you honor its structure in your singing. I like to think about it responding to the airflow coming up from your torso like a boat responding to the waves of water. You want to let the larynx respond to the air you're sending up. So as you can see, this is a very intricate, interdependent ecosystem of vocalism. Your body use, your breath management, your phonation, your laryngeal position, and then all of the shaping of the vocal tract thereafter all have an interdependent dance that they do together. No one part is isolated from the other, but we do have to work on certain principles in isolation so that we can then start to combine them with other things that we master. This may lead to lots of other questions about how you coordinate your breath with the phonatory patterns and then the laryngeal positioning and vocal track shaping for whatever styles or genres you're focused on. I always tell students at the conservatory, the more I learn about singing, the more I realize that I'm in this vast ocean of knowledge that I just feel mystified by. And there are certain practical tools that I feel like I have command over and that at the same time, the voice is such a mysterious thing to work with and a pursuit full of wonder. So if you're feeling mystified by all of the things that you've learned, then that's terrific. I hope you will maintain that wonderful openness and curiosity. It's really precious. It's as powerful as playing. And I will link some videos in the description that explain more about breath management if that's something you'd like to learn more about. And I'll also put some videos that you can check out about registration. If you're struggling with laryngeal coordination, it may also be tied in with management of this big bundle of muscles we call the tongue. So I just uploaded a video about that last week, how to make your tongue your best friend when singing and you can grab that right here. That information together with this understanding will help you coordinate and make a lot of connections that should set you on the road to more ease and freedom. And if this video sparks some more questions for you, please feel free to ask in the comments and I will answer you there or I will just make another video if it's a deeper question than can be answered in the comment section. Most of all, please remember that there is only one you and somebody needs to hear the story that only you can sing. Love much. Now go sing.